We are truly thankful. I am truly thankful for the presence of each and every one this evening, for uh, being able to be together and for the time that we've had to be together today. Truly how encouraging and how much it means and should mean to us to be in the presence of one another and knowing that we are also in the presence of God. Appreciate very much the lessons that we heard this morning. I appreciate Brother Donahue for having presented them and certainly benefited from them. And we all, I think, benefited from the experience that he has had in dealing with the matter that was spoken upon this morning. And if there was for the benefit of those that may be logged on to the internet that did not get to hear and see both lessons this morning, then I'm sure that they are logged on to uh, YouTube. I'm not sure about uh, Facebook. I have no experience uh, with Facebook, whether there's an archive. I have no idea, but anyway, definitely on, Facebook, on YouTube, there is uh, the ability for you to go back and be able to view lessons that have been presented in the past. So if you're listening online, certainly we urge you to do that if you did not catch those lessons this morning. In a newspaper article, they was entitled, The God of Good Intentions. This was in the Sand Mountain Reporter on August the 6th of 2022. This was an article in the paper a week ago from yesterday. And it was written by Daniel Rogers. And I'd like to read, for us to read, the article and try to understand the things that he is stating. And I do quote, Whenever I tried to justify something that I did that was wrong, I was told the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I also heard this parable used to talk about differences between churches and worship, doctrines, or methods. I know they love Jesus, but you know what they say about the road to hell. While I understand the meaning of this parable, one question always comes to my mind. Do people who make it to heaven all have bad intentions? Another question concerns this reality that different believers do things differently. Their worship styles may differ. They may meet on different days of the week. They may use different religious terminology and they might believe different things. Do these differences mean that they can't work together as fellow Christians? Do their good intentions count for anything? And how does God view differences like these? Does the Creator look at someone's heart, even if they may not be doing things which I might interpret as the right or prescribed way? To answer this, let's turn to the Hebrew Scriptures. After Israel rejected God as their king in 1 Samuel 8, they went through a long succession of kings who, for the most part, led the people away from God. They worshipped idols, stopped keeping the land Sabbath, and even quit worshiping God as a nation. Eventually, though, King Hezekiah rose to power, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord as his ancestor David had done. Second Chronicles 29, 2. After calling for the Levites to sanctify themselves so they could perform their priestly duties, Hezekiah made a covenant in his heart to the Lord. Chapter 29, verse 10. This included restoring the place of worship, returning the singers and the instruments as God commanded, and reinstate 
the burnt offerings. Chapter 29, verses 30 through 36. Once things were put back in line with the law, Hezekiah wanted the people to keep the Passover, but there was a problem. By the time priests and Levites restored the temple and cleansed themselves, it was too late for them to keep the Passover as a nation. God had specifically said that the Passover was to be in the first month, but there simply wasn't enough time to make that happen. They put together a plan to keep the Passover in the second month, something that did not follow God's pattern. This plan seemed right to the king and the assembly, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 4. It's interesting that no prophet stood up and said, now wait a minute, Hezekiah, if we're going to follow the law of God, then we need to just wait until next year to keep the Passover. You may have a covenant with God in your heart, and it may seem good to you to do this, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We ought to obey God rather than man. Instead of something like that happening, the Bible says the hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the officials commanded by the word of the Lord. Chapter 30, verse 12. So the people came, despite it being the second month, and despite many of them being unclean at the assembly, chapter 30, verse 18, God looked at their heart and blessed them. We as Christians may have different understandings of scripture, different styles of worship, and different methods, but we can work together as Christians towards a better world because God looks at our hearts, and we, like Israel and Hezekiah's day, all have one heart and one mind through the Spirit. May we show the same grace towards others that God shows towards us, because God is a God of good intentions. You might be asking the question, well, what denominational church is this fellow a member of? Well, the rest of the article at the bottom says Daniel Rogers is a co-minister for the North Broad Church in Albertville. This, of course, is a church that professes to be the Church of Christ. That's on Highway 75, if I'm not mistaken. Because of the name of the article, The God of Good Intentions, that's what I want to give tonight's lesson, the title of being as well. The God of Good Intentions. If I want to, and what I do, I want to begin by reminding ourselves of some of the quotes that I've just read in this article to get these quotes back into our minds. One of those quotes, and I do quote, another question concerns this reality that different believers do things differently. Their worship styles may differ. They may meet on different days of the week. They might use different religious terminology, and they might believe different things. Do these differences mean that we can't work together as fellow Christians? And what I want to particularly us to take note of in this statement is do the good intentions count for anything? Keep that one in mind and let's look at another one. And how does God view differences like these is a question that he asked. And another quote, does the creator look at someone's heart even if they may not be doing things which I might interpret as the right or the prescribed way. 
I think that it's because of these statements, and of course others as well, that here is the conclusions that we can draw. Conclusions that I think are meant to be drawn from this article. One is that what justifies and makes right what is believed and practiced in religion is solely determined by a person's good intentions. Another way of maybe saying that is that people are justified doing things on the basis that God is only looking at their hearts and not so much at what it is that they're doing. And what this amounts to is, I'm understanding the article as it intends to be understood, that really all the important thing is the heart. Whether or not the heart <clears throat> is doing, believing the things that it does, and it has good intentions as it believes and practices the things that are being done. You recall that as proof and justification for these statements, he refers to King Hezekiah in Second Chronicles chapters 29 and 30. And this all concerns the time of the observance of the Passover. We're all familiar with the Passover. It was instituted because of God bringing the plagues upon Egypt when Israel was in slavery. It was the death of the firstborn that God instructed Moses for the children of Israel to take the lamb, to kill it, to take the blood, spread the blood over the doorpost and lentils, and for Israel to remain inside their houses. And that night the angel of death would pass over and would see the blood. And those that were inside the house where the blood was would not suffer the death of the firstborn. And this is what came to be known, and this is what God wanted Israel to remember as the Passover. God passed over Israel because of the blood that he saw. And God gave specific instructions regarding the Passover. It was something that was to be observed yearly. We find that our Lord was observing, and one of the very last things that we read of him as his existence upon earth was observing the Passover with his apostles. And, of course, it was at that final Passover that he instituted the Lord's Supper. So we're familiar with the Passover. But this is what Mr. Rogers does in an attempt to justify the things that he has said in regards to God being a God of good intentions. He makes these statements. Again, let's make notes of some of the quotes. He said, they put together a plan to keep the Passover in the second month, something that did not follow God's pattern. This plan seemed right to the king and the assembly. Second Chronicles 30, verse 4. Another statement, it's interesting that no prophet stood up and said, now wait a minute, Hezekiah, if you're going to follow the law of God, then you need to just wait until next year to keep the Passover. You may have made a covenant with God in your heart, and it may seem good to you to do this, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You ought to obey God rather than man. Now, based on these statements, then he said they did not follow God's pattern. It seemed right. And no prophet stood up and rebuked Hezekiah and the nation of Judah then it's okay. It's okay to change God's law and God will bless because God is a God of good intentions. So, now that we see the use 
that he has made of Hezekiah and the Passover, what's the answer? What's the answer to this article? What's the answer to the proof that he gives to substantiate the fact that God is a God of good intentions? And has he rightly divided the word of truth, which we know 2 Timothy 3, verse 15 says that we must. He said there was no prophet that said, wait a minute, Hezekiah, and goes on to give the rebuke that the prophet would have given. The reason that there was no prophet that stood up and rebuked Hezekiah and the nation of Judah was because there was nothing to rebuke. There was nothing to rebuke in what Hezekiah did. It was not a plan. That was the word he used. It was not a plan, but God had authorized. Another way of saying that is that God had permitted the observance of the Passover on the second month. So it wasn't a plan that Hezekiah and Judah put together. That's what he's wanting us to think that occurred in 2 Chronicles 29 and 30. Here was a plan that they put together, and because of their good intentions, God accepted it even though it wasn't according to God's pattern. The truth of the matter is it was according to God's pattern. It was according to something that God had allowed, God had permitted, and therefore God had authorized. And yes, it's true. God commanded the Passover to be observed on the 14th day of the first month. That we read in Exodus chapter 12. God authorized. The Passover, that was the day when he instituted it, that the children of Israel were to come together once every year and observe the Passover on the 14th day of the first month in the Jewish calendar. But in Numbers 9, verses 9, 10, and 11, during the time of Moses, there was a situation which arose regarding the Passover. And let's read those three verses. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, so we have the Lord speaking to Moses. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, if any one of you or your posterity is unclean because of a corpse or is far away on a journey, he may still keep the Lord's Passover. On the 14th day of the second month, at twilight, they may keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. See, here is the authority. Here is the precedence that allowed Hezekiah and all of Judah to observe the Passover on the 14th day of the second month. And we find that the reason that they observed it, Hezekiah, was because, as Second Chronicles 30 and verse 3 says, that because a sufficient number of priests had not consecrated themselves, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem. So no, it was not a plan that was concocted by Hezekiah. It was not a plan that violated God's command and that God just simply allowed it because Hezekiah had good intentions. Hezekiah was authorized to use the second month in which to observe the Passover. In fact, I think Mr. Rogers needs to read the verse that he quoted there in Second Chronicles chapter 30 and verse 12, he needs to read it a little more carefully. It says, also the hand of God 
was on Judah to give them singleness of heart to obey the command of the king and the leaders at the word of the Lord. You see, they obeyed the command of the king and the leaders at the word of the Lord. In other words, they were doing it according to the word of the Lord that he had allowed back up there in where we read a moment ago, in Numbers 9, verses 9 through 11. They were doing nothing more than what Numbers 9 allowed there during the days of Moses when he was leading the children of Israel. So that's the answer to this article. That's the answer to the supposed proof that he uses to justify coming up with the plan because it seemed right and because of good intentions, God let him do that something that was not according to his pattern. What I want to do now is to consider some of the consequences of this article. This article which is teaching that God will accept whatever belief and practice that we wish to have because God is a God of good intentions. There are consequences whether Mr. Rogers wants to accept these consequences or not. Did not Moses have good intentions in wanting to supply Israel the much needed water there in Numbers chapter 20? We know what God told him to do, don't we? In verse 8, he tells Moses, speak to the rock. We know what Moses did. The Bible tells us in verse 11 that he struck the rock twice. Well, we know the water came out. So let's say that the water came out. Moses was justified because of his good intentions and the story ends. Right? No. No, it doesn't. And we know it doesn't. And I'm confident that Mr. Rogers knows it doesn't. God tells Moses and Aaron in verse 12, you did not believe me. That's what God told Moses in the end of this. You did not believe me. And he also goes on in that 12th verse and says, you will not bring this assembly into the land that I've given them. So what's the lesson? The lesson is so much for good intentions. It put Moses in a position of not believing God of all people, Moses. Now this doesn't mean that Moses didn't believe there was a God. This just simply goes to show us that whenever we fail to do something the way that God tells us to do it, we do not believe God. And because of whatever the good intentions we have, there's consequences. And Moses had to face those consequences. All of his 120 years was for the purpose of wanting to lead the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. And now, here, because on this occasion, Moses did not believe God, he was not able to do that very thing. God led him upon a mountain. He showed him. But Moses was not going to enter. Despite the good intentions. Did not Ezra have all good intentions when he put out his hand and took hold of the ark when the oxen stumbled? We read about that in first, or Second Samuel chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Could not God have looked into Ezra's heart and saw Ezra's good intentions and overlooked what he did? 
You know, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. We're talking about probably the most important piece of furniture that was made by Moses. It was put into the tabernacle and later into the temple. It had been conquered by the Philistines and finally David is bringing it back. He doesn't do it properly. And that's another story. But God gave command that no one was to touch the ark. And yet here on this occasion, as valuable of a piece of furniture as this ark was, the oxen stumbled. The ark is on a cart. It appears for sure that this ark is going to suffer damage. And Uzzah, out of the goodness of his heart, reaches up and studies it to make sure that doesn't happen. Now, did God overlook it because of those good intentions? Here's what we read in verse 7. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah. And God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. God punishes error. God punishes disobedience regardless of good intentions. What about those that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 7. In verse 22, Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? You see, they were prophesying. They were casting out demons. They were doing many wonders, quite obviously, they were being done with good intentions because each one of them said that we're doing these things in your name. Who can question, who can doubt the good intentions on the part of these people that were doing what they were doing? And yet, Jesus said to them with all of their good intentions, verse 23, I never knew you. That's bad enough. But you know what's even worse? <laughs> Jesus says, depart from me. You that work lawlessness. Jesus said, I never knew you depart from me. But look at their good intentions. Still, what they were doing was lawless. It was without authority. It was without approval. And anything that is without authority is lawlessness. The King James uses the word iniquity. But we have no trouble understanding what lawlessness is. It's without law. It's without authority. It's without permission. You know, these are just like folks today. Folks today that want to remember the Sabbath day instead of worshiping God on the first day of the week. These are just like folks today who refer to the preacher as being the pastor, even though he doesn't meet the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. So it's like he said, there's, there's a lot of terminology that's kicked around in the religious world, but according to him, it doesn't matter what definition or what use you make of that terminology, as long as you've got good intentions. And it's just like folks today who believe baptism is to sprinkle or to pour water on a person. It's like folks today who believe in worshiping God with mechanical instruments of music. And it's like folks today who partake of the Lord's Supper once a month, 
once a year, or maybe they partake of the Lord's Supper on some other day, other than the first day of the week. You know, I firmly believe that they all have good intentions. Don't you? Don't you believe the people that worship on the Sabbath day and keep the Sabbath holy, don't you think they've had good intentions? I do. Don't you think that people who call the preacher the pastor, don't you think they have good intentions? When they do that? Don't you think people that say that baptism is sprinkling and pouring, don't you think they have good intentions? Those that use mechanical instruments to music, don't you think they have good intentions? I don't think any of them say, we are being contrary to God's will. No, I don't think they have that attitude. They think they have the attitude it's okay. That God would accept whatever it is that I will do under him if I have good intentions, if I have the right kind of heart, just like this Mr. Dan Rogers is doing. I firmly believe they all have good intentions, and I know you do too. And yet, this is where Mr. Rogers and this article that he's written differs from the Bible. There are just simply too many instances in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament where people with good intentions acted contrary to God's will and suffered the consequences. There's just too many instances. We, we just looked at, what, three? We can multiply that number. But you know it as well as I know it. That the scriptures are full of people doing the wrong things and yet having good intentions. So, in conclusion, with God being the God of good intentions, you know, we could just as easily believe that baptism has nothing to do with saving a person. Baptism has nothing to do with the washing away of sins if our intentions are good. My dad preached for 18 years that baptism didn't have anything to do with saving you. And I don't question his intentions whatsoever. But he was wrong. He was teaching error. He was practicing error. And so then, too, Mr. Rogers, in his line of reasoning, this is not an eye opener. It's a door opener. It's a door opener to anything, nearly anything, and everything that a person wants to do in religion. I think he was intending for the article to be an eye opener, but it's way yonder more than that. Or at least it accomplishes a way yonder more than just to open people's eyes. It opens way too many doors. To him, the only determining factor, whether it's right or wrong, is the person's intention. And friends, that could be nothing. Nothing could be any further from the truth. The road to hell that he kept bringing up in the very beginning of the article, the road to hell is most definitely paid with good intentions. Some of you may have read this article, maybe some of you didn't, but if you want a 15-minute version of this sermon, I plan to bring it on the radio program tomorrow at 11.30. But I thought it was an uh, article that we needed for those that did listen to it or read it to be able to have answered. And that's what we need to always as Christians, especially from those that are supposedly of 
kindred minds and kindred spirits, and when they see here, that's not at all the case. We need to be ready to give an answer to every man for the reason of the hope that is in. Tonight, if there are those here that have not obeyed the gospel, let us not leave or close this coming together without providing that opportunity. There are those here I know that are of age of accountability that need to obey the gospel, and we urge you to do so. There are those that may be here who have once obeyed the gospel, but yet you've allowed things in your life that are contrary to God's will. And again, I hope we understand that it doesn't matter what your intentions are. It's a matter of whether or not we are doing according to the will of God. That's what Jesus went ahead or stated first in that passage in Matthew 7. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but it's he that doeth the will of my Father. That's what we always need to be concerned with. What is the will of the Father? And we know what that will is because we have it in written form. If we have violated the will of the Father, let us acknowledge it. Let us be determined to repent, to turn from it. And if necessary, confess our faults to one another. Now is the time and opportunity while together we stand to sing.